Hi guys and welcome back to my channel, The Audio Program. And on this channel, I read school-based literatures as well as innovative and life-changing books. So feel free to recommend any books as long as they're in these categories. Right, so without further ado, let's get into it. We're currently reading A Life of Pi by Jan Montel, narrated by Claudia Dinkasabana. We're going to start off with the author's note. Author's note. This book was born as I was hungry. Let me explain. In the spring of 1996, my second book, a novel, came out of Canada. It didn't fare well. Reviewers were puzzled or damned it with faint praise. Then readers ignored it. Despite my best efforts at playing the clown or the trapeze artist, the media circus made no difference. The book did not move. Books lined the shelves of bookstores like kids standing in a row to play baseball or soccer, and mine was the gangly, unathletic kid that no one wanted on their team. It vanished quickly and quietly. The fiasco did not affect me too much. I had already moved on to another story, a novel set in Portugal in 1939. Only I was feeling restless and I had little money. So I flew to Bombay. This is not so illogical if you realize three things. That a stint in India will beat the restlessness out of living, out of any living creature. That a little money can go a long way there, and that a novel set in Portugal in 1939 may have little to do with Portugal in 1939. I had been to India before, in the north for five months. On the first trip, I had come to the subcontinent completely unprepared. Actually, I had a preparation of one word. When I told a friend who knew the country well of my travel plans, he said casually, They speak a funny English in India. They like words like bamboozle. I remembered his words as my plane started in descent towards Delhi. So the word bamboozle was my one preparation for the rich, nosy, functioning madness of India. I used the word on occasion. And truth be told, it served me well. To a clerk at a train station, I said, I didn't think the fare would be so expensive. You're not trying to bamboozle me, are you? He smiled and chanted, No, sir. There is no bamboozlement here. I have quoted you the correct fee. The second time to India, I knew better what to expect and knew what I wanted. I would settle in a hill station and write my novel. I had a vision of myself sitting at a table on a large veranda. My notes spread out in front of me next to a steaming cup of tea. Green hills heavy with mists would lie at my feet and the shrill cries of monkeys would fill my ears. The weather would be just right, requiring a light sweater mornings and evenings and something short sleeve to midday. Thus set up, pen in hand, for the sake of greater truth, I would turn Portugal into a fiction. That's what fiction is about, isn't it? The selective transforming of reality. The twisting of it to bring out its essence. What need did I have to go to Portugal? The lady who ran the place would tell me stories about the struggle to put the British out. We would agree on what I was to have for lunch and supper the next day. After my writing day was over, I would go for walks in the rolling hills of the tea estates. Unfortunately, the novel spurted, coughed and died. It happened in Metheran, not far from Bombay. A small hill station with some monkeys, but no tea states. It's a misery peculiar to would-be writers. Your theme is good, as your, as are your sentences. Your characters are so rudy with life, they practically need birth certificates. The plot you've mapped out for them is grand, simple, and gripping. You've done your research, gathering the fact, historical, social, climatic, culinary that will give your story a feel of authenticity. The dialogue zips along, crackling with tension. The description bursts with color, contrast, and telling detail. Really, your story can only be great. But it all adds up to nothing. In spite of the obvious shining promise of it, there comes a moment when you realize that the whisper that has been pestering all along from the back of your mind is speaking the flat, awful truth. It won't work. An element of missing. The spark that brings to life a real story. 
Regardless of whether the history of the food is right, your story is emotionally dead. That's the crux of it. The discovery of something so destroying, I tell you, it leaves you with aching hunger. From Metheran, I mailed the notes of my field novel. I mailed them to a fictitious address in Siberia, with a return address equally fictitious in Bolivia. After the clerk had stamped the envelope and thrown it into a sorting bin, I sat down, glum and disheartened. What now, Tolstoy? What other bright ideas do you have for your life? I asked myself. Well, I still had a little money and I was still feeling restless. I got up and walked out the post office to explore the south of India. I would have liked to say I'm a doctor to those who ask what I did. Doctors being the current purveyors of magic and miracle. But I'm sure we would have had a bus accident around the next bend and with all eyes fixed on me, I would have to explain, amidst the crying and moaning of victims that I meant in law, then to their appeal to help them sue the government over the mishap, I would have to confess that as a matter of fact, it was a bachelor's in philosophy. Next, to the shouts of, the, of what meaning such a bloody tragedy could have, I would have to admit that I had hardly touched Kierkegaard, and so on. I stuck to the humble, bruised truth. Along the way here and there, I got the response. A writer? Is that so? I have a story for you. Most times, the stories were a little more anecdotes, short of breath and short of life. I arrived in the town of Pondicherry, a tiny self-governing union. I arrived in the town of Pondicherry, a tiny self-governing union, territory south... Ugh! <coughs> I arrived in the town of Pondicherry, a tiny self-governing union territory south of Madras, on the coast of Tamil Nadu. In population and size, it's an inconsequent part of India by comparison. Prince Edward Island is a giant within Canada, but history has set it apart. For Pondicherry was once the capital of that most modest of colonial empires, French India. The French would have liked to rival the British, very much so, but the only raj they managed to get was a handful of small pots. They clung to this for nearly 300 years. They left Pondicherry in 1954, leaving behind nice white buildings, broad streets at right angles to each other, street names such as Rue de la Marine and Rue Saint Louis and Capis Cups for the policemen. I was at the Indian coffee house on Nehru Street. It's one big room with green walls and high ceiling. Fans whirl above you to keep the warm, humid air moving. The place is furnished to capacity with identical square tables, each with its complement of four chairs. You sit where you can, with whoever is at the table. The coffee is good and they serve French toast. Conversation is easy to come by. And so, a pry bright-eyed elderly man with great shocks of pure white hair was talking to me. I confirmed to him that Canada was cold and that French was indeed spoken in parts of it, and that I liked India so, and so on and so forth. Usual light talk between friendly, curious Indian and foreign backpackers. He took in my line of work with a widening of the eyes and nodding of the head. It was time to go. I had my hand up trying to catch my waiter's eye to get the bill. Then the elderly man said, I have a story that will make you believe in God. I stopped waving my hand, but was suspicious. Was this a Jehovah witness knocking at my door? Does your story take place 200 years in a remote corner of the Roman Empire? I asked. No. Was he some sort of Muslim evangelist? Does it take place in 7th century Arabia? No. No. It starts right here in Pondicherry just a few years back and it ends. I am delighted to tell you in the very country you come from. And it will make me believe in God? Yes, that's a tall order, not so tall that you can't reach. The waiter appeared. I hesitated for a moment. I ordered two coffees. We introduced ourselves. His name was Francis Adrubasami. Please tell me your story, I said. You must pay proper attention, he replied. I will. I brought pen and a notepad. Tell me, have you been to Botanical Garden? He asked. I went yesterday. 
Did you notice the toy train tracks? Yes, I did. The train still runs on Sundays for the amusement of the children, but it used to run twice an hour every day. Did you take note of the names of the stations? One is called Roseville. It's right next to the Rose Garden. That's right. And the other one? I don't remember. The sign was taken down. The other station was called Zoot Town. The toy train was two stops. Roseville and Zoo Town. Once upon a time, there was a zoo in the Pondicherry Botanical. That was a very long time ago, he said. Yet he agreed to meet. We met many times. He showed me the diary he kept during the events. He showed me the yellow wood newspaper clipping that made him briefly, obscurely famous. He told me his story. All the while, I took notes. Nearly a, li- nearly a year later, after considerable difficulties, I received a tape and a report from the Japanese Ministry of Transport. It was as I listened to that tape that I agreed with Mr. Aldru Basmi that this was indeed a story to make you believe in God. It seemed natural that Mr. Patel's story should be told mostly in the first person, in his voice and through his eyes. But any inaccuracies or mistakes are mine. I have a few people to thank. I am most obviously indebted to Mr. Patel. My gratitude to him is as boundless as the Pacific Ocean. And I hope that my telling of his tale does not disappoint him. For getting me started on the story, I have Mr. Aldru Basmi to thank for helping me complete it. I am grateful to the three officials of the exemplary professionalism. Mr. Kazuhiko Oda, lately for the Japanese embassy in Ottawa. Mr. Hiroshi Wantanabe of Oika Shipping Company. And especially Mr. Tomohiro Okamoto, Okamoto of the Japanese Ministry of Transport, now retired. As for the spark of life, I owe it to Mr. Mr. Moakri Sklyer. Lastly, I would like to express my sincere gratitude to the great institution, the Canada Council for the Arts, without whose grant I could not have brought together the story. That has nothing to do with Portugal in 1939. If we citizens do not support our artists, then we sacrifice our imagination on the altar of crude reality and we end up believing in nothing and having worthless dreams.